A chemical attack on a Syrian city. It's the most serious accusation yet against the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Up to 1,300 dead, according to rebels. Multiple intelligence agencies say it's a definite possibility the rebels are telling the truth in this one. But here's the question. How do we know for sure? How can we be sure? There are a lot of strong indications that a chemical attack did take place, according to our next guest. Some of them, some of the indicators just haven't shown up yet. Intelligence expert John Thompson joins us from Toronto. John, there, there's a controversy as to what kind of attack took place. Here's my question. If, as, at, the, if at the end of the trail, men, women and children die in their sleep, does it matter what the chemical agent was or does it matter that we don't call it a, a chemical agent? Isn't dead dead? No, I mean, dead is dead, and there, we, God knows we've got enough ways of killing people, and a, a dead child is especially a, an abomination under any circumstances. But the thing is, did they die because they were uh, sort of on the outskirts of fighting? Were they deliberately targeted? But or even worse, were they deliberately targeted by their own side just to become propaganda victims for a, a particular point? And... In the, the Syrian civil war, I mean, there are atrocities enough going around on both sides. But the funny thing is, is that the way the Syrians built their chemical weapons in the, in the 1980s and, and what they selected was for battlefield use, not for use on civilian neighborhoods. They've got the wrong agents for that. Uh, but the other thing is that if you're involved in a vicious civil war, you would want to use your chemical weapons, if you're going to use them, to attack enemy fighters. But all of a sudden, it seems like both sides keep seem to be hitting neighborhoods that are full of women and children and not fighting men, not combatants. And it's just very, very curious. Again, you, you want to use a decisive weapon in a decisive manner, not in this nitpicking way where you kill 500 people here, uh, 50 people there. Then, of course, the other point is the evidence. And, and in the Arab world in the last 30 years, we've seen an awful lot of faked footage and an awful lot of footage that's been carefully presented for the world's cameras. Uh, and, and it's been getting worse. And some of the evidence that's been offered up on camera so far is really not conclusive. In fact, actually, it suggests that this is, uh, again, another made-for-TV fraud. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to explain uh, how we figure out whether or not it, 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 it's fraud or, or not. But as far as the attack on civilians, wasn't it Assad's dad? I mean, you, you've got the history much better than I do. You, you, you know it all. Uh, and I'm not uh, being hyperbolic. I mean, you know your history. That's, 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 that's who you are, John Thompson. Isn't it true that his dad, that Assad's dad, uh, wiped out an entire city of civilians? With yes, chemical he, weapons? He, he, well, he wiped out a lot of the, uh, the parents and grandparents of the current rebels in the attack on Homs. When the Muslim Brotherhood, which again is involved in the current rebellion, and you know, the Salafists uh, went after him in the early 1980s, and they wiped the town out. But they did most of it with, chemical, uh, sorry, with conventional weapons, but they flushed the ruins with poison gas. That's at least one of the allegations. But again, Assad and the Syrians are not alone in this. The Egyptians have used chemical weapons in the 1960s. Uh, the Saudis used them to clean out the cellars of the, the Grand Mosque after the, uh, the, the Wahhabi sect did the takeover in 1979. The, the Libyans and the Iraqis have famously used uh, chemical weapons. So, I mean, what Syria is doing is not that unusual by Middle Eastern standards. No, but the only reason I was pushing back uh, lightly on, on, on the premise... Of, of your discussion was that uh, there's there are lots of unfortunately uh, uh, the lots of examples in the Middle East of people using chemical weapons on civilians, including members of Assad's own family doing that. Oh yeah, you know it, it's almost all of the proven cases of chemical weapons use since the Second World War have been by Arab countries in the Middle East. The now, one exception the... was Iran, which is, of course not an Arab country, but they were using them on Iraqis and in response to Iraqi chemical weapons use in the 1980s. As far as uh, the staged massacres and, and what have you, I mean, uh, we've seen some of that as far as uh, Israel's foes are concerned, uh, bringing the media in uh, to whip up as much anti-Israel rhetoric as possible, and, and, and they succeeded. Uh, the media playing along with the idea that there was this massacre in Jenin, a Palestinian refugee camp. There was no, no massacre there. As a matter of fact, the Israelis went door to door 
and uh, were rather brave in doing so. I mean, they just could have sent in choppers and planes and strafed the entire camp, and they didn't do that. They went door to door, taking their lives into their own hands. Israeli soldiers, several of them died doing the the door-to-door searches. And then, of course, you had a, a similar situation just in the north of Israel, in Lebanon, where you had staged massacres. Well, uh, yeah, you, actually, uh, a lot of reporters used to call some of the, the product coming out of uh, the Palestinian Authority, Pallywood. You know, if, you, if you're a news photographer, a, a news cameraman, you've co- and you've covered war zones, you know what it's like to get the shot. And real combat footage isn't really, really graphic. But then you've got all this stuff coming out of the Palestinian Authority, you know, heroic gunmen running around and presenting themselves boldly around corners, which is not the way people behave under fire. You know, photogenic children being frightened were in the background. Everybody's calm and collected. Um, it got even worse in 2006 with Hezbollah. And suddenly realized that you had the same grandmother sobbing in front of three different houses the Israelis had purportedly destroyed on her. And she was from Hezbollah Central Casting. Uh, and other manufactured events. There was the events where the Israelis actually did bomb a house full of women and children. But the number of corpses far exceeded the uh, original count. And again, it was carefully staged managed so that you had, you know, the children being carried out of the house uh, in the optimal light for television footage. And, you know, the, you know Saddam Hussein used to apparently stockpile bodies of children so, for uh, staged media events and, and so on and so forth. And here we keep getting dead children and more dead children. And probably most of them have died as a result of this war. And that is hideous. But again, it looks like they're being stockpiled for, for footage like this. And they are not displaying the symptoms associated uh, often with a, a chemical weapons attack. Same thing with a number of the people who are hospitalized. If you have had a chemical weapons attack, you know, with blister agents or nerve agents, which are persistent, they're known as area denial weapons, and you are treating them without wearing ha- uh, hazardous material gear yourself, you're also going to become a casualty. So people clustered around and patting down someone who's a nerve gas victim without wearing you know, full medical uh, protection gear are also going to become casualties. A nerve gas patient, I mean, nerve gas kills in a really ugly way. It's not hard to get on uh, YouTube and look around. You'll see animal tests with nerve gas. The footage is there, and you get an idea of what a nerve gas victim could look like. They don't lie there very, very still in a hospital. And same thing with mustard gas. We've seen, even dating back to the First World War, what the casualties of a mustard gas attack look like. And we are not seeing that here, but we are seeing lots of children often swathed up so we can see their heads and their faces and their tiny feet because that is also a a poignant little image. But because the rest of them are all wrapped up in thick cloth, we don't know what actually killed them. So, I mean, are these children who were killed by gunshots and shell fragments who, again, who've been shelved as evidence of a chemical weapons attack? So we don't know precisely what killed them. But we know they're gone. We, we, we know they're dead. And so do you frame policy based on the weapons used or on the outcomes? Well, I think that the point is that we've got here is evidence that both sides are pulling, uh, trying to tug at our heartstrings. And they are, it seems like they are crafting events uh, designed purely for propaganda. I mean, it, it's bad enough that women and children are being killed. But if you're saving the corpses or you are deliberately killing women and children for propaganda, uh, that is just, well, I mean, it says everything you need to know about both sides. And, of course, the other point is that if we go back to the Bosnian War, one of the things that made Canadians really unpopular with the Bosnians in Sarajevo was a couple of the mortar uh, attacks on the uh, Sarajevo market. You know, and really, you know, 120 millimeter mortar bomb splashes down in a crowded market and everyone's screaming and the television cameras are there. And, you know, what a mortar bomb will do in a crowded market is ugly and graphic. But then you had Canadian military officers, again, trained and experienced, coming down, looking at the crater and going, hey, wait a minute, the Serbs didn't fire this. This was fired by, you know, from Bosnian positions. In yeah, other words, discovering, yeah, discovering that people will kill their own. I mean, it just doesn't get any for propaganda. less moral than that for propaganda yeah. reasons. John, thank you very, very much for the visit. Much You're more welcome. on our next visit. Thank you very much.